Hello and welcome to the latest Faster Project online webinar panel session. Today we are going to be discussing the question, you know, do you need a driveway or a depot to run electric vehicles? Are EVs the reserve of middle class suburbia with their own driveways and their own charge point on the wall? We've got a fascinating panel uh, lined up today. And as you can see, it's probably going to be quite hectic because we've got one, two, three, four, five. Six. Yeah, there's 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 nine. <laughs> nine panelists this will be fun um but they are yeah uh, from all across the sector and they also include local authorities who've gone about um supporting people without driveways but with evs in various different means so there's something in this for everyone and if you're an ev driver who's looking to find a way to be able to run an EV without charging at home. Hopefully you'll get all the answers you need and lots to pester your local authority about. And if you're a local authority, please have your pen and paper at the ready because we are covering everything that will allow you to do this. Um, but of course, uh, this is all about the, the Faster Project, the Faster Project's running this. So Donal, would you like to give us an update on the latest state of play? I believe we're going to be talking about Northern Ireland today. Uh, thanks, Ewan. Uh, yes, we have we have quite a lot to, a lot to get through this morning. Um, and as you say, I just want I suppose give a quick update on where we're at with the project. Um, I'm sure quite a lot of people on the call this morning on the webinar um, will have seen some um, media activity over the past week, particularly around the Northern Ireland uh, procurement exercise, um, which our project partners are leading on. And that has been temporarily suspended um, while the documents for that are reviewed and revised. Um, some of the sites um, within, the, within the original documents uh, have had to be um, revised again just due to capacity issues. So we've been working with um, our council partners and NIE networks um, over the past few weeks just to identify um, a number of alternative sites uh, across the council areas. So that work has been continuing and we do hope that the revised documents will be back out again over the next uh, few days within the next week or so. So it is positive. It's uh, sort of a temporary issue and like all projects, there's always um, challenges and bumps along the way, but I suppose moving to more positive um, news, uh, work in Scotland will begin next week. So Scottish Power there will be starting work on, on the sites on the sites there next week. Uh, so we expect a break ground on the first site or two um, next week. So we're on track there to start seeing some infrastructure over the summer months. Um, in the Republic of Ireland, again, um, we are finishing up on the procurement exercise there and the expectation from Louth County Council is that we will be appointing a CPO for there um, before the end of June um, and again with work beginning um, at um, the beginning of July. Um, in terms of the work that we've been doing here at Southwest College, um, we are beginning production work on the next series of the EV Talk films tomorrow here in Enniskillen and then filming will be moving to Newry uh, next week. So we're really looking forward to, to seeing those films um, and working with the team on that. Um, also, I'm working away on the series of roadshows um, and we plan to have the first of those in Fort William on the 26th of August, and then again here in Enniskillen on the 23rd of September. So lots more information to, to come on those. So really excited about those as well. Um, I think probably for now, that's probably my update. Um, if you do keep an eye out on um, our social media channels and website um, for any updates on the NI procurement exercise. But as I say, the revised documents should be available again over, over the next few days. So um, that's that's where we are at the moment. Uh, thank you, Donald. I noticed that Mark McCall from EVA and I has asked about the the missing two chargers from the, the Northern Irish tender. There seems to be two that were removed. I know that obviously there were capacity issues. Are they going to be? Yes, again, I suppose it, it is something that we're we're looking at. Um, we've been looking at additional sites and um, looking at options for various sites. So, what I'll say is, stay tuned, Mark, and hopefully we'll have we'll have more information on that to to share with you. Some positive information to share on that over the next couple of days. 
I'd also be interested to know about the, um, the exact nature of the capacity issues, just how far short of the capacity they were, um, which potentially could lend itself to battery back chargers and so on. Um, obviously, the Vasta project has a, a certain budget, etc. But in order to just try and improve charging infrastructure across Northern Ireland in particular, um, given that it is so far behind uh, the rest of the UK and Ireland, it'd be interesting. Do you have any details about the available capacity at those sites that are now under capacity? I don't personally, Ewan. Um, I suppose it's our project partners at Ulster University that have been working on, on that side of the project. Um, but it's something that we can probably, once once we get through this this next sort of week or two, we'll probably be able to provide a bit more information around what, what the key issues were. But I know they've been working with the councils uh, very closely and with NIE networks to resolve, resolve those issues and to, to move forward as quickly as we can. Thank you. And a very final question. Actually, um, on the topic of questions, I see there's a few that are coming through in the chat. If people can put their questions in the Q&A, please, that makes sure that we'll definitely notice them rather than being lost in the, the flurry of the chat. There's always such a, an active chat on these webinars. Um, so please do put your questions in the Q&A rather than the chat. But Mark Anderson asks if the, the Northern Irish tender can now be delivered in the time left um, for the, the funding. I suspect that um, if the tender is about to be reissued um, and if a hardware provider is, is selected that has a good lead time on its, its hardware, then that should be feasible. But Donald, uh, an official response on that one? It definitely, we're, we're very much hopeful that yes, that if the documents are released again, um, and obviously it will be, uh, the industry will let us know um, whoever responds to that to to that procurement exercise, uh, but we're very much working on the, on the basis that the project can be delivered. Excellent. Thank you, Donald. And without any further ado, into the, the main item of the, the agenda today, um, do we need a driveway or a depot to charge electric vehicles? So time to introduce our star studded panel, um, starting up with uh, a panel for a panelist from last time, Kate Terrell from ChargeSafe, who has an EV but doesn't have a driveway and is an expert on ensuring that charging infrastructure is as accessible and safe as possible to everyone who needs it. Um, we have a couple of local authorities with us today who've catered for people who don't have driveways in their own um, you know, very advanced ways. So we have Ryan Robertson from East Lothian Council and we have Paul Gambrell from Oxfordshire County Council. Um, we also have some innovative hardware providers who specialise in providing charging infrastructure for people without driveways. So looking at, um, at those, we have Mark Constable from Trojan Energy, Paul Wilkinson from Connected Curb, and we also have Shane Rees from Chargey. Uh, we also have Ben McDonald from Nodem, which has created an innovative solution to allow you to charge your car at home without a driveway and without having to rely on uh, a council or a charging network installing infrastructure near you. So uh, stay tuned for that one. We have Joel Teague from CoCharger, which is about sharing uh, your own home charge point, if you have one, with your neighbours uh, in a bookable platform. And finally, we have Anant Kapoor from Guided Energy to talk more about what fleets can do if they don't have access to charging infrastructure back at base. So thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We'll uh, switch on all of your, your mics and cameras now um, for the first question, which is, is it possible to drive an electric vehicle without a driveway? So as I said, Kate, um, you are one of, of three panellists here um, who've looked into driving electric without a driveway and you've you've been at it for a while i believe so tell us about your experience then oh you appear to we seem to have lost audio on you kate so what we'll do <laughs> what we'll do whilst you're starting your audio we'll go to shane who's also got a, an ev without a driveway tell us more shane cool okay uh thanks Ian. and in so, the meantime uh, kate just try and shout across shane <laughs> until we, we can hear you <laughs> and then we'll let you know <laughs> Yeah, so I think so. So I, I live on a hill. Um, I don't have a driveway, um, and I'm fortunate enough to have a Tesla. So that makes living with without a driveway a hell of a lot easier. Um, I also happen to live in the charging desert, which is Surrey. Um, there's not a lot of local charging around me, but um, you know, you 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 work out what your favourites are. So if I'm if I'm going away, I do quite a lot of mileage for work. Uh, did over twenty four thousand, uh, yeah, about twenty two thousand miles last year. If I'm, if I'm on the road, Tesla supercharging makes makes things super easy. Uh, but around around me uh, locally, I I have some pod points in a um, local uh, shopping centre, which is about a ten minute walk from me. Um, 
super cheap way to charge. Uh, so if we're not doing anything on a Sunday, I will I will plug in there and I get a full charge for a pound. Um, otherwise, I've got a mirror, which is um, a sort of a five minute walk for me. And that kind of that tends to be my my default, uh, a rapid charger. It's quite expensive, but it's, you know, convenience kind of wins. So basically, you're uh, you're managing just fine. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And um, in a in a second, uh, if if we get to share some slides, we've got a little like thirty second video that found on the BBC. It doesn't work for everyone, so um, you know we, we might be uh, advocates and enthusiasts for for all this kind of change. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll show you a, a snippet from a BBC report uh, very recently of how uh, a resident of Milton Keynes found that walking three quarters of a mile to his local council uh, charge points in a, in a nearby car park was enough of a hassle for him to go back to a, a plug-in hybrid. Now, that's interesting because I know that Joel, who we'll, we'll come to later, is um, is very much keen to stress the, the convenience of being able to charge right next to your, your home or in a, in a reliable format. So that's I reckon if we save that video for then, and then okay. we can bring in Joel as well, because that is definitely where we're going to be discussing some very positive points. But uh, Joel is definitely part of that solution as well with CoCharger. Um, so, Kate, we, we've re-established audio. Tell us more about your experiences. So um, when I very first got my my first EV, I was living in Reading um, in quite close to the town centre. So there were a few places nearby that had driveways um there were some public charges over in the uh the oracle shopping center um and i got by it was absolutely fine i was only there for a couple of months moved back to portsmouth and was able to have a charger installed on my driveway which i promptly uh registered with the co-charger app so um that was that was like the my humble beginnings i then got to live with the driveway for a year which was just sensational um, and i felt very smug <laughs> for the whole part of that year and then i moved again so in a city portsmouth is really highly built up terraced housing um you can never guarantee that you're even going to be able to park directly outside of your house so uh, a solution similar to what ben's offering over at nodem um, just wouldn't have have sat with what we were trying to do uh, what we're trying to do there we've got on street charging um which is a whole nother thing and i'm going to get around to that in a second um and then we've got a, a, a light spattering of public charges in the local area so how do i do it um with actually um quite a lot of ease so my office here i don't know if you can see mm -hmm. the cars out yeah the, this car that i'm pointing to right here that's plugged in so there are six chargers right there they're all sevens um and they're free so you know we're we're limited to four hours on them because it is in the visitors bays um and we're only really allowed to charge that for four hours i'd love to be sat there for eight hours because i would just walk away with 100 percent every day and it'd be great um but we don't always need 100 percent. so that's completely free to charge so whenever i can I will plug in and use that four hours um, as often as I can throughout the week whilst I'm here at the office. If I do, however, have a situation where I go away, say to fully charged life south, um, and I drive home and I would like to charge overnight because I have to return to fully charged south the following day, I would use the on-street charger. Now, <laughs> those on-street chargers are causing me a little bit of a headache at the moment because they were put in by one network provider. Um, all of these support calls happen to be going to another service provider. Something's happened. They've fallen out because when I called to find out why the three charge points I had tried within uh, like a five minute walk of my home address, they weren't working. I called the number on the sticker. I called the number on the app and I was told very bluntly that they didn't take calls for that particular service provider anymore. Um, I don't think they're not here. They're not in this room. Um, they're, they're not one of the good guys, that's for sure. I think they're one of the earliest contenders um, into the game. But what's happened is at some point, the service of taking customer telephone calls, reinitiating a charge remotely, um, just offering that support service has broken down. Nobody has replaced the telephone number on the application or the sticker. When I asked um, who I could speak to, they 
really had no idea. They sent me through to another telephone line, um, which was a pre-recorded message saying our offices are open Monday to Friday, nine to five, and it's 7 p.m. on a Friday evening, and it's also a bank holiday, and I have to be at fully charged <laughs> the following morning. So my stress levels were already climbing. Um, and that's that's just not good enough. So that is something else that I do really want to pick up is if we're offering infrastructure services of any type, whether it's on street, whether it's public, rapid, base destination, you know, what Joel's doing, we need to have customer support service 24 seven. This is a lifeline for people. Um, you know, some, if, if I needed to drive someone to the hospital that evening, would I have been able to do that? Like that we really need to be thinking about this in, in a much more urgent manner in terms of the level of service that we offer. Um, I did manage to uh, crawl the car over to the pod point over the road um, at the supermarket, and that was absolutely fine. Though they're regularly extremely busy. So Portsmouth has got this whole thing going on at the moment where we've got millions of residents. I'm seeing more EVs on the road all the time, which is fantastic. Terrible air pollution levels. The council were obviously um, under this big push to, to cut air pollution um, and encourage EVs, but the, the support and the infrastructure that's there is just ridiculous. So um, that's my moan. However, I'm still able to do it. And I think it's fine for someone like me who understands the industry and has come into this understanding, you know, that it's going to be a bit of a challenge sometimes. And I think for that reason, I have more patience. But if I was Joe off the street, I can absolutely see why people would abandon EV dreams and just return to a nice vehicle. And we need to do more to ensure that that doesn't happen. It, it strikes me that for local authorities who are allowing charging networks to operate on their streets, that there needs to be a performance clause and an escape clause within those contracts that say, if you fail to uh, maintain this infrastructure and if, if one remains broken for X number of days rather than weeks um, or, or months, that uh, that contract should be ripped up and it should be retendered to, I mean, for a start, there's at least three panelists here who would clamber over each other to get that piece of land uh, where that charge point is. Um, also, it strikes me that um, from a technical perspective, uh, if you don't have a driveway, it would potentially be beneficial to get a, a, an EV that's a rapid charging omnivore. So if it has the highest power onboard charger that you can possibly find and is also pretty quick at charging on CHAdeMO or CCS. So, uh, for example, old Tesla Model S's with dual onboard chargers, OK, you know, not the cheapest car, admittedly, but they are Swiss Army knives. 22 kilowatts on AC, which maxes out an on-street charge point, no matter what it is. Um, CHAdeMO adapter, CCS adapter and the proprietary supercharger socket. Uh, that came in very handy in my outer Hebridean road trip recently uh, where I was completely reliant on public charging infrastructure because that 22 kilowatt AC charge point could charge the car within a couple of hours realistically um, given the, the starting state of charge of that charge. So yeah, um, just from on that, that front, perspective. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Sorry you had to interrupt you. Just on that front, obviously most of us will be, will be aware that the, the law is going to change very shortly. So anything that's three phase is going to have to have um, contactless payment. Contact. So when that comes in, that's going to push the price of 22 kilowatt units and 11s up massively. So I think that every most charger that's on the street will will be 11. Uh, sorry, will be seven, mm. and there might be one or two within a string of chargers that will be um, three phase. That's a good point, um, and that is. <sighs> I mean, it's, it's a self-defeating rule, that isn't it? It's understandable for DC rapid charging, but for AC, come on. Um, it's, yeah, is it Grant Shapps who's responsible for that one? Please review before you shoot the, you know, the EV sector in the foot. Um, but uh, Paul, yeah, you'd like to come in, of course, as a local yeah, authority yeah, expert. Point, so, yeah, on that point, I mean, we actually have it written into our strategy that all public charge points must have contactless payment, and we will continue to maintain that all the way through. Well, that's because you're doing a great job over there, Paul. You need to be speaking to everybody else <laughs> because you've you've set the standard um, as Ryan has done up, up in Scotland. You know, um, Oxford and Scotland absolutely are the leaders um, in terms of the local authorities on on charge infrastructure, and I really applaud that. So, is there any way that you can have a chat with Portsmouth Council and, and just get them on board, please? Uh, it's not just us. I have to say, there are several other councils that agree with that particular. Uh, point of view um, and certainly I've been involved in some um, interesting discussions 
um, in uh, Levi planning meetings where uh, I can remember myself and uh, to name check one of the other councils, Suffolk, was sort of making the, the strong case that contactless has to be the way forward and you can't rely upon apps for everything. That's a fair point. Yeah, I thought particularly for DC and for, you know, for your kind of higher power AC, I suppose, there's, there was always the argument that for the cost of a, a say, like a seven kilowatt AC post versus the cost of a contactless terminal, that um, it, would, it would obviously push the price up. But clearly, with the, and we'll, we'll be coming on to how you've funded your charging infrastructure in a minute, but clearly that model does allow for economically viable contactless payment. On, on AC, so I'll be interested to find out more in a minute. Shane, just before we, we move on to the next point, yeah, very quickly. Yeah, so, so just pick that up. Uh, um, so terminals add a huge amount of cost to low power charging. I think Paul's probably on board with this one, but um, it's uh, when you look at the cost and, and how how long those devices last in the in the wild, exposed to the elements, exposed to stuff that people do in the public realm um vandalism and all that kind of stuff we reckon it adds about 250 pounds a year to the running cost of an ac charge point and that's the cost of the device how often you need to replace it it's monthly running costs and then um payment or not not even the payment processing fees and when you boil that down to how much of a cost premium does that put on ac charging it's somewhere between you know sort of seven seven kilowatts and uh, and below and you look at the usage patterns of those uh public charge points it it adds between somewhere between two and six pence per kilowatt hour to maintain that provision and i think when you understand the the charging behaviors of people who use on-street charging as their default they're using those charge points again and again and again you know high repeat use so when you're doing something often, actually an app is a is an easier way to manage your your charging sessions. So I think um, you know places places where you use charge points that you don't don't use very often, um, and that's the normal use case for those those situations. Contactless makes sense. Uh, places where people use those charge points as almost like a, a proxy for their their home charger, it doesn't. It adds a lot of cost and increases the driveway divide uh, or the pavement tax you know lots of names for these for these extra costs mm. that are numbered on uh, on cpos uh, in our space but um yeah i think that the, the economics of it make it really hard um very quickly from from mark then then paul literally sort of 10 15 seconds each and then we'll move on because we have a busy schedule ahead of us but uh, yeah mark yeah so i was just going to make the point that currently residential charge points don't have to have contactless regardless of power because under afir 2017 they have an exemption along with uh, you know single manufacturer proprietary networks uh, and it remains to be seen yet as to whether the consumer experience regulations will mandate contactless for residential only charge points which are not defined as public access even though they're in the public realm uh, and it could go either way um, and you could end up with a scenario whereby it's not compulsory but councils still want it because they think it is mm, good point that needs to be clarified paul very quickly just to say um, that we we think oh, sorry future, sorry paul w uh, we think the future is um a connected curb it will be plug and play um a, a two dollar chip on your car you plug it in and it talks to the charging point and your payment methods all built into the car so adding it now for three years, four years down the line, when it will be completely redundant, seems a, a waste of resources. But. 100%, basically doing what Tesla has done for, for ages now. That's a really good show. We do need to move on. We have a hectic schedule, but we can hopefully come back to some of these points at the Q&A session later. Speaking of which, remember everybody questions in the Q&A. Um, so uh, how can people without a driveway charge their electric vehicle? What solutions are available? So I'm going to very quickly share the screen of one local authority who's, who's not here today, um, just to show you what Dundee's done. So this is Princess Street Charging Hub, one of many charging hubs that they have. And as you can see, they have a solar powered charging canopy above six rapid chargers and three 22 kilowatt AC posts. There's also an on-site um, battery storage system that's actually made of old Renault Kangoo electric van batteries stacked on top of one another. Um, so this is designed to basically be like a petrol station for electric vehicles. It's very popular with the local uh, taxis, delivery vans, 
basically business drivers have really warmed to this as well as local residents, but it's particularly the businesses that have warmed to it. And as a result, one of these AC charge points for kind of longer term parking has actually been removed and replaced with another rapid charger for a quick top up and then on you go again. So um, it's interesting to see how the infrastructure has been shaped in Dundee for residents and businesses that are you know, that don't have driveways and are reliant on a charge in the middle of their, their shift. But uh, Paul Gambro, Oxfordshire has gone for community charging hubs as well, haven't they? So uh, I'd be interested to find out what you've been doing to support residents without driveways. Yeah, um, so as I'm not quite as fancy as Dundee's, I have to say, let me put up a picture of uh, what sure. ours look like so you can see that. Just a second. Right, hopefully you can see. So, yes, there we go. Um, hmm. Oxfordshire is, well, you know, a medieval county. Um, and so we have uh, very narrow pavements, putting on street charges in is very difficult. Um, and this all stems from a, a conversation about three, four years ago now between myself and a colleague where we were talking about a particular road in one of the market towns in Oxfordshire that we both knew very well and trying to work out how we could get electricity supply in there for EV users. And we can't remember which one of us said it, but one of us turned around and said, well, it's blue and daft, isn't it? Because, you know, there they are on one side of the road and there's a car park on the other side of the road. And we went, we looked at each other and went, hang on. Um, and we did some mapping work thereafter and not surprisingly realised that the major centres where we need a solution for people who don't have off-road parking actually lie in the centres of the old towns where there usually is a district council car park. So we took that idea forward with um, a couple of local companies who were entering this particular space, uh, got some innovate funding, did a feasibility study, which then led on to the project, which was called Park and Charge. And we now have 20 car parks, 250 charging points across Oxfordshire that, um, and just show you sort of so you get an idea of where they are. Um, I will point out that this map is slightly out of date because they're all live now. So where where there's blue ones on there, they're actually all live now. Um, and basically the idea was, and again, we supported this by doing some polls with people that as long as we were within a four minute, uh, sorry, a five minute walk of local residents, they could use the car park free of charge, even if there was a cost during the day to park up their car and charge overnight. Uh, they, we only put in seven to 22 kilowatt AC chargers because two reasons. Why, why did we need anything more when we were focusing on people actually being able to park up and use these chargers uh, for longer periods? Um, and also uh, we wanted to make them as easy and as competitive for use as possible. So um, there's a special rate for people that are parking overnight in that it reduces slightly after uh, 9 p.m. They're all contactless, as we mentioned before. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting note there that uh, when we first set them up, 90% um, of people were using contactless. Um, even now, after most of them in an operation for a year, 18 months, we're still seeing over 80% of the transactions being contactless. Um, the usage is more than double what the charge point operator easy charge expected at this stage of the game and we're now beginning to see the shoots of what we hope to see which was the overnight usage growing because we always knew that there was going to be an issue you know people um, don't have um, the usage there you know we needed people to have confidence that the charges were going to be there before they'd start buying the EVs. And that's precisely what we're beginning to see. It's interesting to note though, that that charge, that example of one of the sites that I put up, which was in Henley, uh, as part of this, we also did some road shows and went out to some of the sites we were putting charges in and engaged with local residents and that sort of thing. So they knew what was coming. Um, but at that Henley one, we, we walked into an, un, uh, an untapped demand because there were already lots of people in the locality with EVs that were charging up their cars at work and things like that. So that one went in um, and 
uh, already had overnight usage, overnight demand to start with. And the other interesting thing about it is we're all, the, uh, the operator is already looking to expand capacity there because they're just, you know, there just isn't enough charges in the ground. So um, you, very quickly, you say that the, the operator is looking to expand capacity. Um, yeah. Presumably they're not going cap in hand to Oxfordshire County Council and saying, no. can you pay us to do that? They're doing that with their own money for your benefit. No, uh, that's quite right. To you. And that's part of our philosophy is if we can get the charges in the right places to start with, um, then, you know, the business case should fund the future developments and the future expansion of the, the network itself. And indeed, you know, um, as part of what we're looking to do on Levi, this will be a very, very much a cornerstone of all the stuff that we're going to do. Um, it, it, it falls in with the, um, the strategy we've put together for Oxfordshire, that we're going to try and keep as much off-road as possible. That's not to say that there isn't a place for on-road mm. charging, because there is. But, you know, let's, let's make a backbone of these things so that people know that they're, they're dependable. The other thing is they're in number. They're, the minimum that we put into any of the car parts was five double-headed charges. Most of them were six. And there's what a couple that are 10 because we wanted people to have the visibility that you know it wasn't just one or two charges in the corner there was quantity so that uh, as evs grow which they are doing in oxfordshire at quite a quite a rate that there would be the capacity there for them to use them amazing and very very quickly so obviously this is a, an ac charging network that quite uniquely has contactless payment on it and as you're saying the majority of 90 percent of, of transactions are still contactless is there a cost differential a tariff differential between using contactless and using say an app or an rfid card because presumably there'd be a monetary uh, yeah, cost difference it would be cheaper i mean the idea was that the app would offer benefits for people who were using the charges time after time, yeah. you know, the local residents. And we're quite surprised actually that it's still up and over 80% of usage. I, I, I get the impression some of it's just down to people having an app fatigue and don't want another mm. app on their, on their phone. Um, but I'm sure, you know, people will cotton on to the fact that they can get a slightly cheaper rate if they, if they register. Um, uh, with the the operator over time, and yeah, we've seen a small amount of that so far. Um, yeah. The other thing to say about them is not so much on the early ones because we were learning as we went, but on the later ones, um, again, as you probably saw from that, we're putting in some wider bays. We we see at the moment they have a dual function. One is for people with you know with a disability that have an EV, it makes it easier because we're not putting in at this moment in time, disabled only in the charges. But the other thing they're being used for, and we've seen a lot of this um, with the overnight users at times as well, is vans. So, oh, yeah. you know, um, not every one of the 20 car parks is accessible to a three and a half ton van, but I think there's about 16, 17 that are. And we're getting a lot of usage from delivery drivers that have got an EV um, here. I'm, I'm just outside Bicester, and the local uh, DPD operate uh, depot is uh, trying to be fully electrified, mm. but they don't have enough capacity on site. So guess what? Most nights when you walk through Bicester, there's this line of DPD vans on one of the sites, all charging, getting their, uh, getting ready for the next day. So, um, you know, they, they, we're, we're finding some interesting things happening that we never thought, we didn't anticipate to start with, but perhaps we should have, but... Uh, you know we're learning from that experience and that's going to be sitting there biting his tongue because that's exactly the sort of thing that he specializes in pairing fleets with the public charging infrastructure but due to time constraints we will need to to run on so we've seen oxfordshire's community ac charging hubs in central locations funded entirely by the charging network um so Oxford, basically it's cost you nothing uh, and it's benefited residents usually um ryan east lothian council's done uh all sorts of things because you're ever the pioneer aren't you so i believe you've got a couple of slides to show us how you've been supporting people without driveways um so it'd be useful to see that and to find out how you've funded that and how you intend to take that forward in the future thank you Yun. now i'm just going to seamlessly share my screen can i can i 
Oh, yes. Look at that. Nobody noticed a pause in my presentation there. Hopefully it works. So, right. hello, uh, EV Infrastructure Officer for East Lothian Council. Um, that's where East Lothian is, it's in Scotland. Uh, the red one, that's we map from Plugshare, just showing uh, a bunch of our chargers. Um, we're about 107,000 population, so compare that to like Oxfordshire, which uh, Google tells me has loads, loads and loads. So, you know, massive difference uh, in scale of the problem, but, you know, how different are uh, different semi-urban, semi-rural local authority areas? Not really other than scale. Um, so we've, in a way, got it easy. You know, we've got a small, um, a relatively small area, um, which uh, we can do quite a lot in. Um, so uh, Ewan's touched on maybe what I'd term a journey charging centric um, provision by local authority and Dundee city council's um, strategy. Um, Paul has touched on a destination charging centric um, strategy maybe. Um, and I'll um, give a bit of information on our on-street um, centric um, uh, infrastructure. So yeah, I, what do I mean by on-street? So you could conceive this as being on-street, you know, it's literally on the carriageway, which could be like, you know, the narrowest definition of what a street is. Um, the chargers are just in a bit of um, underutilized street space um, on street. Um, is that really on street um, or is this on street? Well, these are kind of in little pockets, um, kind of off street perpendicular parking or maybe, you know, town centre parallel parking. But, you know, it's not really um, indicative of where most people park in, in uh, the UK. Most people park like the vehicles behind uh, my last Tesla there, um, uh, you know, the white um, Fiesta and the red, whatever it is, Audi. And most people park parallel on a residential street where parking is unrestricted. Um, so to, 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 for people to switch to a plug-in vehicle with the least change to their behaviours, they really want to, I think, park and charge near or, or in the same place as they, they usually park their vehicle. Obviously, that's a problem because um, it's, it's very, uh, we can't um, install chargers everywhere, um, even if money wasn't a, an object, um, but we can install chargers quite a, in quite a lot of places. Now, as I say, East Lothian is quite a small local authority area in the grand scheme of things, so it's been more of a soluble problem uh, for us. So we've got quite a good head start, I think. Um, and we've done quite a lot. Um, so it almost turned them like curbside, not curbside. Uh, curb is a different thing, curbside chargers. And here's some examples. Um, as you can see in the background, there's some uh, relatively high density um, housing, uh, including the, the very like, nice misty shot in North Berwick where a lot of the kind of old Victorian uh, villas are massively subdivided. Um, so th there's lots of, um, uh, different um, residential scenarios in, in East Lothian. It's quite representative of, of um, I think, the UK in, in, in microcosm. Um, so where have we got to? Uh, we've got um, one of the highest numbers of on-street households with an attachment of a charging uh, site in the UK. Um, and here's just a quick idea from one of our uh, medieval um, town centres with some urban sprawl out into the 60s of the sites that we've de um, delivered in just one um, area and those that uh, we are considering um, in the near future. And you can see the, the residential buildings being colour coded uh, between those who do have a driveway or other safe place to park and charge at home and those who do not. So, and uh, the purple line is uh, walk time, walk or wheel time or, or walk wheel distance isochrone of I think 400 metres. Um, so almost all the, the residences, I think, who um, do not have a safe place to park and charge will be within a very short distance of a, a, a charging site potentially in the future. This is one of the, the council estates built in the 60s. It's actually called the electric estate because it had the um, storage heaters. Remember those? Uh, they were innovative at the time. And these are the types of sites. Um, and you can see the uh, an isochrone of actually 50 metres, I think this is. Um, so really quite um, a dense network we're planning in certain areas to, to meet need. Um, the, the reason that there's need here is that a lot of these um, residential um, dwellings or um, dwellings within the residential buildings are you know up some steps behind um, you know some some paths some stairs or just like down a lane it's really complicated for these people even to use things like cable covers cable arms cable gullies so they really do need public charging 
Uh, this is quite a techie slide, but um, it kind of goes into the power demand required um, for that kind of um, infrastructure, and we've costed this out, um, and also, you know, how many uh, connectors could we provide, um, you know, in an end game um, scenario, and in some instances, you could actually, if, you know, money was no option, maybe provide one connector per vehicle, that seems, you know, ridiculous, I don't think we'll need that many connectors per vehicle, probably, you know, a much um, uh, lower ratio. Um, but it could be done in a lot of areas because there's actually a lot of uh, space for parking um, on our residential streets. Here, if we zoom out to another site, you can see uh, the coloured icons are uh, sites we've deployed. That's both journey chargers in orange, destination chargers in blue, and on-street chargers in black. You can see we're only really just starting um, the deployment of on-street chargers uh, after forming a core of uh, journey and destination chargers in all of our towns. And all the, the targets are potential future um, sites of almost entirely um, herbicide um, bollard style types. Um, so yeah. Uh, there's lots of other ways that people could um, do this, such as charger sharing on uh, driveways or charging as a service, maybe charging robots or you know, um, carts or vehicles um, that are, are um, have an attendant and go around charging people. Um, but, you know, the simplest solutions, I think, will be covers, gullies, arms and public chargers. Uh, why do we need to do this? Um, well, because, as Paul uh, pointed out, um, sometimes vehicles can't access um, uh, car parks. Sometimes drivers don't want to go and park in car parks, and this is particularly a problem for vans. Um, one of our um, backbone sites, Wallyford Park and Choose, is on the left there. You can see how um, it is accessible to longer vehicles, um, and uh, we do have a lot of accessible bays in our uh, destination car parks. Now, you know, currently that I would find that's like accessible to um, those with mobility issues uh, or mobility needs, but the, increasingly that could be as demand increases. Um, um, accessibility to longer vehicles and more of a community um, uh, location. Because um, um, a, a van is very similar to a longer wheelchair adapted vehicle. Oh, and I think that's the end of that. Uh, so yes, hopefully it's Thank you very time much. There. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Ryan. That was actually, it covered some very important points that were raised in the chat as well by, by Kate and Joel. Uh, with regards to um, you know to van provision, and also I think that a few of the panelists will be quite pleased to see some of their um, charging solutions name checked, well, effectively name checked in in that presentation too. But with regards to that charging infrastructure that you've installed, um, how was that funded by East Lothian Council? And as um, you know, the Transport Scotland funding and Charge Place Scotland as a network looks to be changing over the next few years, how will you be funding this going forwards? Yeah, so historically we secured funding, and I, I say that you know we we did go out and secure funding. We weren't it didn't just um, arrive in our lap. You have to go out and secure funding. That's the same whether it's um, one hundred percent grant funding or you're looking for a cocktail of funding from from various sources, borrowing, um, partner funding, say tips from a uh, charge point operator, etc. So in the, in the past, we've been lucky enough that there has been 100% um, funding available in Scotland, either from Transport Scotland or as a top up to the on-street residential, the OZEV on-street residential charging fund, which we have applied for and secured uh, five times in a row. Um, not only we didn't get in there in the very first year of its operation, otherwise I think it would have been six years, um, but uh, yeah, we've been, we've been successful. Uh, and am I right in saying as well, there's, okay, this is useful for some parts of the, the FASTER project, which covers Scotland, um, Northern Ireland and Republic of Ireland, but Scotland specifically, the Scottish Futures Trust has um, has worked with Transport Scotland to provide some sort of 50-50 funding where it's 50% up Transport to Scotland, 50%. up to 50%, and then the rest is private sector. So the likes of uh, some of our fellow panellists today, whether it's Trojan Energy, Chargy, uh, Connected Care, you know, you presumably... Um, they could part fund the installation of their hardware with the top up from Transport Scotland, which is a bit of a, a Brucey bonus, basically. Or entirely fund. I mean, uh, all funding needs to be needs assessed so that um, uh, the taxpayer gets value for money. Um, however, when you're looking to do um, a, a dense distributed network of chargers like we are, um, then how commercially attractive is that to partners? There is an argument for more um, subsidy than um, other types of infrastructure. Yeah. 
And uh, I mean, that's one of the big blockers I've heard from some local authorities has been the funding side of things. But the fact that there's options specific to, to Scotland, but also looking across all of the UK and the Republic of Ireland, clearly the concession model works, as, as Paul Gamble has, has pointed out, um, you know, and, and then I believe you said in the chat, seed then surge, put that initial amount in, and then it just grows off the demand of, of basically build it and they shall come. Um, other constraints that I've seen uh, or, or concerns I've seen mentioned include uh, traffic regulation orders for on-street charging infrastructure. So obviously you showed a lot of charging infrastructure that is on street there. There are some local authorities that don't have a, a TRO that would allow them to enforce charging only bays. Um, was that an issue in East Lothian and how did you overcome it? Yeah, so all of our core infrastructure or destination and journey chargers are covered by strict traffic regulation orders. You must be plugged in our uh, journey chargers as 50 kilowatt uh, DC plus or 43 kilowatt AC plus. Remember 43 kilowatt AC when it used to complicate everything. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so all of our journey chargers and uh, destination chargers are strictly controlled. They're well marked. Um, there shouldn't be any uh, confusion about what those are for. Whereas our on-street chargers are all labelled uh, to say this is not a char no, there is no charging bay here it's, um, for anybody to park at because um, though we do have a lot of um, space and unregulated residential streets to park you know that space is, a, is, a, is at a premium and we cannot or do not want to uh, restrict access to, to those spaces to just one type of car remembering these are just cars um, they are no different with all the problems that cars introduce um, and all the advantages of a car as well. Um, but we did not want to restrict um, uh, space on residential streets um, overly when we had that um, good network of, of core network of journey and destination chargers. It's um, been quite successful. I mean, this is the business model um, of Ubertricity um, and others, um, and it appears to work. And um, yeah, it'll be, it'll be interesting to continue to scale that and get um, uh, lots and lots and lots of feedback back. Um, I don't think uh, TROing um, uh, too many, too, too big a part of the ecosystem is sustainable in the long term. So you have to get into this, you know, um, situation that, you know, charges are ubiquitous and steal ubiquitous tagline. Um, and uh, it's a first come first serve. Um, and there's lots of things we can do to, to um, make that or mitigate the issues of you know not getting uh, they are first such as information and apps etc which says when a site is busy much like a mcdonald's parking occupancy sensors like that um oh. to to start giving people um, information en route to uh, their normal overnight parking area excellent and a, a final question on this for yourself ryan and also paul gambrel so did your local authorities have any kind of legislation around private charging networks operating or private industry operating on council land? You know, uh, maybe something that was designed to stop a burger van from hanging out in the corner of the car park and, and selling lunch to people. But that I'm aware that there are some local authorities that um, are unable to allow the likes of the concession model that Oxfordshire is using because of legislation like this. So was that something that you came across and how easy was that to resolve? I'm guessing it just wasn't an issue. Um, <laughs> Silence. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, what I was going to say was we haven't got legislation quite like the way you described it, Ewan, but mm. uh, what we have encountered is leases on land which preclude us from making a profit. And then there's a there's a question there of are we making you know exactly where does the um, EV charging infrastructure um, come in that and that's something we're testing at the moment. I mean I must be honest, the, the car parks we chose when we did park and charge, because we had to move quickly, we deliberately chose the ones that were easy. But it is something we're now testing, and it depends on how the lease is written. We're finding at the moment. Good to know. Thank you very much. Um, so we've covered how local authorities have provided charging infrastructure, uh, whether it's communally or on street um, for people without driveways. Now let's have a look at some of the interesting hardware options that are available. Now, Ryan name checked Ubertricity. Um, unfortunately, the panel is so big that there's, there's loads of options out there. But, um, you know, obviously they're, they're not here with us today, but we do have a, a small cross section of what's available. There's one, another one that Ryan's got, Charge Light. Um, yeah, another option, which is similar to Ubertricity in terms of installing a charging socket 
in a lamppost column, the switch towards LED lighting means there is a bit of spare capacity now in street lighting networks that allows that trick to be carried out. But Paul Wilk, oh, for goodness sake, he's got another one. <laughs> um, Paul Wilkinson of Connected Curb, tell us, and you can show us as well very quickly, um, about uh, the range of products you have for on-street charging. Just unmute myself first, that will help. And hit share screen, move that, and then hit that button there. Share. So we've got a range of products, um, and I'll skip through to this. So that's our node and power pack. So that sits underneath the ground, um, and that's where all the brains sit. So everything above ground is is dumb. Um, and we can deploy just the metal box around the outside before actually deploying the infrastructure into it, which allows us to dig the street up um, once and not keep going back to add uh, uh, additional charges to that um, to that string. That's our chameleon, because it says chameleon at the top. Um, flush the ground, it can be seven or 22 kilowatt, um, single post, one meter above the ground and hits all the, uh, the accessibility standards, as you would appreciate. That's our premium product. Um, this is what most people will see on the ground. This is our gecko. Um, this is a jewel, so you can't actually see it, but there's, a, there's two posts there, a socket on either side, and, um, and that's a 22 kilowatt because there's two boxes underneath. And that's our limpet, obviously not relevant for this because it's not on street, but, um, exactly the same um same idea everything's remoted away to allow for um what's what i'm looking for uh, it's modularity so if something breaks all we've got to do if someone runs into this all we've got to do is go and replace this it's, it's really cheap it's pre-wired 20 minutes um and that's the uh, the infrastructure back into the ground again it's a very robust piece of hardware that that's good to that, know. that one is um Actually, in Sterling, uh, someone may have started me typing away on a keyboard. Someone's actually hit one of these with a JCB, um, and I think they've bent the bucket on the JCB. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, That's a point. You know, so it basically does double as a, as a traffic bollard in a way as well, which um, anyone who has seen the, the World Bollard Association Twitter account will know there's actually um, quite a strong feeling towards protecting pedestrian space. Uh, which in many cities across Europe in particular um, does involve bollard protection. So this has a dual use in a way then. It does. Um, and, and we are moving, as I say, towards uh, towards the, the chameleon away from the gecko um, because of if we wanted to install in the Republic, uh, I'm led to believe that everything needs an emergency stop irrespective of what it is. Um, all we've got to do is adapt this flange plate on either side um, and it doesn't actually impact on the um, on, on the the production lines and our um, supply chains. Superb. Um, that is a, a brand new product to me. I knew about the Gecko. I'd seen it installed. For example, Ryan showed some photos earlier of, of, of East Lothian's um, installation of it. So that's really good. Um, moving swiftly on, uh, we also have Chargy with us today. So Shane, I believe that you have some on and off lamppost charging solutions that you can give us a quick show of. Heads up, you're on mute. Oh, a seamless transition. <laughs> right, so um, I'm sharing. Yeah, cool. So um, yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, I'll try and pick up on some of the points that um, everyone else has made as well, uh, if I can remember them. I oh, happen to you work. You happen to used to work for Uber Tristy, who's one of the, the one of the operators in Portsmouth, where where Kate was talking about. Um, yeah, so let's let's just quickly jump into into what what we do. Um, I've got some stats to share on how drivers have been responding to our night tariff, uh, which is some of the we've had some questions in the Q and A coming up on that. So I've got some stats to share on that too, and I'll try and cram this all into into two minutes. But the, this is our hardware. This is our, our core product. Um, the the one that attaches to lamppost, what we, we call the backpack. You can see on the left hand side there. Um, and one which uh, and our bollard, which um, takes the power from the lamppost when the lamppost is in the wrong place for us. Uh, or there's a 
some sort of contractual issue where uh, there's a PFI operator and they want to maintain some distance between the um, the lamp post and, and our bollard. Those are both seven kilowatt capable and the bollard comes in a 22 uh, kilowatt version as well. Um, without contactless, so the way that uh, people start and stop a charge is, um, is via their phone uh, through a web app. Um, we now also have a, a native app as well, so um, uh, for iPhones, and we're releasing our uh, Android one uh, very soon in the next in the next couple of weeks. Um, we actually sort of started off without an app because people we were concerned that people didn't want an app, um, <clears throat> and we've had lots of customer demand for uh, for an app and. Uh, we're under the eight kilowatt threshold for on-street charging, so we wouldn't need to um, install contactless payment terminals, and it, it does make the economics of this really challenging. Um, and there are lots of different ways to pay, so through a, a range of roaming uh, partners, as well as Google Pay and Apple Pay. So um, you, you might argue that Google Pay and Apple Pay are true con uh, contactless. You don't need to touch a thing. Um, but yeah, so I think there's, um, you know, what, one of the things that Ryan was saying is like, when you think about the number of charge points that uh, the whole sector is going to install in the years ahead, um, you know, so thousands and thousands of charge points and taking away TROs um, in, in future, we are going to need to maintain these things and install these charge points at very low cost in order to keep the, the prices to drivers down. So everything we can do as a, as a sector to remove costs from uh, the installation and operation of these charge points is really important for um, bridging that driveway divide and making charging in public on AC charge points as close as possible to the cost of charging at home. Um, so we, we you know, and I think when we think about who we're trying to serve, it's not just people without driveways. Uh, so there's a huge amount of people, 5 million people in England who rent a home from a private landlord. Think about how hard it is to get a landlord to do something for you, uh, particularly something which might be a lifestyle choice or seen as a lifestyle choice as wanting to charge on your home electricity supply. Lots of those people are going to struggle to charge at home. So on-street charging, public charging is really important to help those sorts of people make the move to electric cars. Uh, there's a lot of people who drive for a living. Um, so taxi drivers, uh, fleet drivers, people with vans who take those take those home. Uh, the Association of Fleet Professionals did some research uh, about a year or so ago with their mega fleets, and they found that those their drivers, um, about seventy percent of them, so much higher number than than the forty percent that we talk about uh, normally, uh, wouldn't be able to charge on their home electricity supply. So these are people who drive for a living in some shape or form. Um, we need to make uh, off-duty charging easy for them, and then disabled drivers. So there's about 2.4 million uh, blue badges uh, in the UK. Um, <clears throat> a good number of those uh, park in the streets. So where you see those disabled bays on the streets, someone nearby is a disabled, uh, disabled person and relies on their car for a quality of life. Uh, where, what, the little picture you can see there is we've where, where we see a lamppost next to one of those bays. Um, we uh, prioritize installation there uh, to make that uh, that disabled driver uh, switch to an electric car easy uh, and the rest of the residents can use the parking bay next to it. Where are going to people, people going to charge? Um, we've got kind of got a bit of a mantra around easy, cheaper and, and greener um, if we get this all right. So these are some forecasts from, from UKPN, uh, UK Power Network. So the distribution network operator in, in the south and uh, of England um, and covering London. I think uh, they've just updated their EV strategy. This is where they see most of the charging demand um, happening today. So about 75%, three quarters of charging happens uh, outside at or outside people's homes. So um, the two green bands, um, <clears throat> only about 5% in workplace, about 5% uh, in destinations and about 17% uh, sort of on the go. And this is what they're forecasting for 2028. So the end of their um, uh, strategy planning uh, horizon, roughly the same. So, uh, you know, charging at home where it's convenient uh, is really uh, what's gonna help pe more people switch to electric cars. I mentioned we had this little video of, um, what happens when when people don't feel supported? There is local charging, but find the the charging process a little bit difficult for them. So let's see how this plays. Uh, 
40% of UK households don't have access to a driveway or garage, and for many people, that is a barrier to owning a fully electric vehicle. People like David, who had an electric car, but had to get rid of it. Fortunately, I haven't got off-road parking, which I could get power to. So it meant I had to basically park in the car park in the village, which is about a three quarters of a mile away. So um, having tried that for a year or so, it was just enough was enough. So I swapped um, over to an e a plug-in hybrid. If I couldn't charge a car at home, I was nowhere I'd go back to an electric. So there you go. So <clears throat> um, car parks are a great place to start, but they do have a finite catchment area. Um, and when people find them, you know, too difficult, uh, you've just heard an, an EV owner who's gone back to a hybrid because he found three quarters of a mile uh, too far away from him. And, that, and that's very recent. That's March 2023. 40%. Oops. Um, so so let, let's just look at uh, tariffs and off-peak charging. Um, this was our uh, former tariff. Um, we had a single rate, 42 pence before um, uh, before December. Uh, and this was the the times that people the patterns for people plugging in and unplugging from our from our network. And what you can see there's a um, a peak in the in the early evening, so around sort of six to seven was when most people tended to plug in their cars, and a, and a peak of unplugging in the morning as people set off for work. You'd kind of expect that. Since we introduced our um, our, our dual rate tariff, uh, so uh, seven hours of uh, cheaper charging from midnight to seven a.m and a higher price for charging during the day, a significantly higher price for charging during the day. Um, this is the, the charging pattern that, uh, that now exists. So you can see the, that evening peak has fallen away dramatically, and we are seeing people physically plug in much later at night. So um, actually going out and plugging their car in at sort of uh, around about the, the time the cheaper tariff uh, kicks in. And um, that's... Uh, <clears throat> done wonders for not only for their cost of charging, uh, but also for uh, the uh, has delivered a number of significant environmental benefits. So this is the um, carbon intensity of the uh, UK's electricity grid over March. Um, this is an average. There were times when, it's a bit when the carbon intensity was lower um, and, and higher. This is the average over March. Um, <clears throat> this was the um, energy usage pattern before we switched to our, our dual rate tariff. So you can see um, uh, about a third of uh, our the electricity we delivered to drivers happened between that, that midnight to 7 a.m. period and about 20% in the early evening peak from 4 to 8 p.m. This is what it, it is now. Uh, for March, so about more than half of the electricity we deliver happens in that very low carbon um, overnight period, and much less, uh, about half the amount of power that we were, that we were delivering during the evening peak is, um, is what we're delivering now. So I think when we think about, you know, the opportunities that EVs have for uh, tackling climate change, improving air quality, how we synchronize or enable people to synchronize their charging with when electricity is greener um, is a really important consideration. And access to plugs is probably one of the biggest biggest things that's going to help people contribute to uh, both on both of those scores. Absolutely, and that's something that obviously people can do if they have a driveway at home. I've got an off-peak electricity tariff, and I I wait until it's cheaper to charge. So it's great to see that um, that charges uh, one of many on-street charging companies that's taking an active lead in those dynamic tariffs. Similarly, um, Ryan and and Paul Wilkinson, there was the Agile Streets project with Connected Curve as well, which uh, I believe incentivized cheaper electricity uh, and was successful in that regard. I'm acutely aware of the time. Mark Constable, Trojan Energy, you have a particularly neat on-street charging solution where we've seen permanently mounted hardware that is quite discreet, of course, but yeah. here's some hardware that when it's not in use, isn't there at all. Okay, thank you very much, Ewan. Uh, if you just bear with me just while I share my screen. Let's get back up to the top. Let's go to there first. 
Okay, hopefully everybody can see that. So what we've got is effectively a 22 or 7 kilowatt charge point, depending on whether it's a single or three phase, that is sunk into the pavement uh, between 350 and 450 mil from the curb, depending on where the local authority wants us to uh, to put it. We issue uh, what we call the lance to uh, our customers, uh, and they can charge right outside their house with their own lance, keep it in the boot of their car, keep it in their uh, property. Uh, there's no app to to uh, access the charge points. The charge point transaction is all completely uh, seamless uh, and automatic. Um, and the charge point is strong enough to be able to drive, uh, to be walked over or driven over um, within, uh, within the urban environment. So we've got two solutions. We've got a hub solution, which you're looking at here, which uh, is our effectively 15 or up to 15 charge points in a row, DNO connection on the street. This is uh, Willoughby Road uh, in Camden, one of our demonstrations demonstration uh, areas uh, and you can see there that there is a line of Trojan charge points some of which are in use uh, with the lances in place and some of which are not and when the charge point is not in use that 16 centimeter disc on the ground is the only thing that uh, uh, remains and so as I've said you can uh, you can drive over it uh, it's rated to BSE and 124 which is 44 ton kind of manhole cover standard uh, and um, it uh, can be obviously um, doesn't impact uh, people with buggies, wheelchairs, people who are cycling, people who are scooting uh, when it's not in place. Um, it's uh, it's a 15, it's a 15 uh, charge point, 22 kilowatt system. Um, uh, and even though uh, we are currently um, exempt from the contactless uh, regulations um, and may continue to be, despite it being 22 kilowatts, because these are residential charge points only, we've taken the commercial decision to develop what you can see there in the top left-hand corner, which is effectively a lance dispenser from uh, our feeder cabinet. Um, and we think that adds no more than about two to three th 300 pounds of cost uh, to the hardware cost for each charge point. So we're actually really looking forward to being able to deploy these. And so we're looking at contactless as an opportunity rather than some others in the industry who are looking at it as a, as a kind of a bit of a pain. Um, so that's the kind of the DNO connected solution. What's probably much more exciting, and to be honest, will probably be more existential over the long term for Trojan itself, is our Aeon uh, solution, which is the same charge point, um, uh, but connected directly into somebody's house. So we are currently uh, demonstrating this uh, in uh, in Oxfordshire uh, uh, with Paul Gambrell's help, uh, who's been a very strong supporter of us, along with uh, their own gully uh, technology, uh, and also the London Borough of Brent. Um, and when I get off the call, I will um, give you a, I'm going to post a little link to an Addison Lee U YouTube video where an Addison Lee driver has um, got their their Aeon uh, and able to uh, you know electrify uh, their uh, Volkswagen ID four that they use for work. Amazing. And, this, and okay, so right this on. yeah, I was just going to say so this this solution is not just for you know residents who want to charge their own car. Uh, home based fleets is another massive uh, challenge for electrification in the UK, uh, and we're very happy to be partnering with companies like Addison Lee and one or two others um, in order to be able to offer this to their their kind of their franchisee drivers um, uh, at a, uh, on a subscription um, basis. The Aeon only works at seven kilowatts most of the time because that's the maximum you can get out of a single phase uh, domestic supply. But if you are lucky enough to uh, perhaps live in a, a block of flats um, where which with a street frontage and there might be a three phase supply to run the lift, for example, um, we can uh, install a 22 kilowatt uh, charger. It's shareable. It, it's operated exactly the same way that Trojan operates um, all of its uh, um, all of its uh, other uh, chargeware on its own platform. Trojan is one of the few completely vertically integrated uh, charge point providers in the UK in that we design, build, own the IP, uh, manufacture, install, operate uh, and maintain. Um, and we're certainly the only EV uh, infrastructure manufacturer in Scotland, um, it, which is interesting because, you know, we've most of our kind of early work has been you know, attracted kind of down in London and southeast. Um, and we're very, very keen to deploy this uh, solution, you know, in our in our home territory. The uh, the other launch you can see there on that slide, that's our Mark II, which
which is a socketed version, which if you can imagine on the previous slide, that's our Innovate UK designed by engineers who don't get out much solution. Um, but we realise it's not particularly attractive as a, as a consumer product. So over the last six months, we've uh, we've come up with this, uh, which is a much nicer solution. It's a lot lighter, gives flexibility for cable, fully designed in accordance with PAS uh, 1899. Uh, and we'll be rolling that out uh, towards the uh, the end of the year. A little bit in terms of uh, some other pieces that we've done. We um, engaged Ipsos to do uh, a big a UK wide survey on our um, behalf to basically find out some of the headlines around people who don't have driveways and their attitudes to EVs. Uh, are they happy to have an EV without a driveway when the time comes? Is there anything holding them back? Um, and we can, we've got some summarised results here that are a bit kind of London and England focused, but I do have the Scotland and Northeastern, uh, sorry, Northern Ireland numbers uh, as well. Um, in, it, particularly that piece at the bottom, people who said they don't own an EV because they can't charge at home. Um, the national number uh, is uh, round about uh, uh, kind of 47%, um, but it's broken down by areas there. Interestingly, in Scotland and Northern Ireland, those numbers are 30 34 and 27 uh, percent. So there are actually slightly fewer people who think that having not having a driveway is a barrier to uh, to, to having an EV um, in, in Scotland and Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland, which is interesting. But the, the key message of uh, of what we're trying to kind of get across in the market is there is nobody who cannot have a home charger. The only thing stopping anybody having a home charger is the length of the cable and the people who need to give you know permission to have that that cable um, installed and we're you know working we're through with a number of councils at the moment we're just about to announce uh, another uh, county uh, wide trial uh, of the Aon technology uh, in terms in conjunction with other you know pavement crossing solutions such as you know the gully solutions and some of the the, the overhead uh, kind of uh, solutions that um, that are coming onto the market now so so that's us really um, you know we think that there's no impediment um, to people who uh, are not having a driveway, uh, having their own um, charger. And we look forward to kind of demonstrating it and getting our commercial um, ducks in a row in order to be able to make sure that we can, you know, deploy this at the kind of the 100,000, 200,000 scale, um, probably over the next five years. Amazing. And on that note, the you're saying about the, the main impediment to this, if anything, being mm -hmm. um, getting permission to install it on the pavement. So that's local authorities in Scotland and the Republic of Ireland, and it's the Department for Infrastructure in Northern Ireland. Yep. So um, coming back to the kind of two closest uh, kind of representatives, uh, so Paul Gambrell and, and Ryan Robertson. Um, obviously, you've been very proactive in the installation of on-street charging infrastructure and other solutions that we'll, we'll come on to in a minute. But um, what, is, what do you think are the main impediments for those local authorities who are holding back and how can we overcome that so that they can become pioneers such as yourselves? The major one is probably risk. Local authorities are very risk averse and need to be convinced of the case of some of this. And the, 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 the bit that follows on from that is we are dealing with legislation and licensing. Um, so I can, I can only talk from the English perspective, obviously, um, that is, had, just hasn't been designed with this sort of um, uh, implementation. And I mean, that's something Mark and I have discussed uh, for many a, a long hour in terms of you know how do we simplify it and, and how do we do it and yeah. you know, we're doing some work in Oxfordshire looking at that um, and we've got some ideas um, yeah I mean yeah. In, my, in my experience I mean I've been in around the industry for a long time you know local authorities have moved a huge distance in that time in terms of their in terms of their culture and now it's almost it's not our experience is not so much the local authorities want to compel us to do something. It's the fact they don't see any other way of legally allowing us to do something without compelling us to do the Section 50s, the on-street um, applications and everything else. And one of our, you know, our big public affairs agenda is to, you know, work with the government and demonstrate that there are better ways of doing it. We don't want to cut local authorities out of the out of the picture. But for example, you know, in the utilities world, statutory undertaking is a thing. I suspect that the EV 
infrastructure um, uh, kind of industry will move towards that. Maybe not quickly, but probably in 10 years time, you won't need any form of planning permission. You won't need a, any form of individual on street permit. What you will need is an ongoing uh, kind of more global dialogue with each individual local authority to manage street works in the way that people who run water, fiber, electricity and gas currently do. Uh, I mean, what my message would be to other local authorities who are currently holding back on this and the Department for Infrastructure in Northern Ireland is look at the pioneers, look at the fact that it's already doable, look at the fact that, you know, you've got your your chargey, your um, connected care. I think Paul had a hard stop at 10, Paul Wilkinson, so apologies for that, Paul. Um, but uh, also look at uh, Trojan Energy. You look at Ubertristi, all the ones who aren't here today who are successful right across the UK and the Republic of Ireland. It's entirely doable. If there's something silly like a, a TRO that you're worried about, Trojan Energy and various other ones could be installed without TROs if you deploy enough of them on a residential street. So even if 13 of the 15 are blocked by petrol cars, the other two which are EV drivers at the moment, can still get in there. And um, as more people electrify, then, you know, there's there's less icing and more active use of that um, that charging infrastructure. Yeah, yeah TROs uh, is, a, is, a, is a dead concept moving yeah. forward pretty much because you can't you can't zone off enough of the street, um, yeah. you know, where it's one, where, you know, and, you know, you know lamppost is, is the ideal the ideal case for like a TRO. But when you've got, say, say like 15, you know, uh, charging charges or connected curb charges you can't you can't zone off 15 spaces on the street so you've got to come up with another with another solution whether it's parking eye technology mm. like we've got or some other some other mechanism yeah and i think it's fair to say to those local authorities who are currently kind of skittish well skittishly watching on from the sidelines likewise department for infrastructure mm. i know that some of your personnel are, are tuned in today um i think it's fair to say uh, ryan you'd be happy to have a chat with them yeah paul you'd be happy to have a chat with them um yeah okay just there they are those those are the people they'll tell you everything you need to know um and we've already seen plenty of, of pictorial evidence <laughs> that it exists and it's successful i'm acutely aware of the time so we will need to race on but very quick answers from shane mark and obviously well from, from paul as well anyone who's wanting to get this infrastructure that we've just seen today um presumably that there are uh, concession models you're able to fund this install it on behalf of the local authority and then just run it yourselves so there's no cost to the, the council is that right excellent they nodded that means yes so you don't even need to worry about money just you know put out a, a concession model tender speak to call paul gambrell he's obviously done it already um so there are other ways that you can charge outside your house which again don't require the local authority to to do very much um one of which uh paul i believe you've actually got with you just now which is the gully um so you can install your own home charge point on your house and then run the cable through this thing can't you yeah um the first thing to say is it's we term we call this the most complex simple solution going because you do need to get involved local authorities in installing this sort of kit and you know, we're a local authority. We have been working with a local company called ODS to develop this. I have to say there are now other competitors out there, um, but we started from a position of this, we were first doing this. Um, and um, it's actually been, we, we're not made, it's not yet readily available in Oxfordshire because we're still working through some of the challenges that we've got. You know, if it's not the Section 50 license or the highways um, uh, planning permissions, um, it then goes on to insurance and various other things. We're getting there. We're going to be doing. So the background of this is back in 2018, um, Oxford City Council, my colleagues at Oxford City Council, did a program called Go Ultra Low Oxford, and they trialed various types of on-street charger. And uh, one of the team, uh, a very uh, clever woman by the name of Elizabeth Bowen, uh, came up with the idea of putting a gully in for the cable. Now, in Oxford, we've got lots of storm drains where the um, downpipe comes in, comes down, you know, at the inside of the pavement, and then there's a slot to take the water across to curbside. And Lizzie looked at that and went, well, why can't we run a cable through that? Um, so when they did Gullo, they basically did a modified version of that in five locations. And of all the of all the things that they tried, it was probably the most successful single 
um, trial. So the idea is you install a home charger, you run the cable down your little bit of frontage to where your gate is. The gully is there. You take the cable safely across the um, pavement and bring your cable out curbside. Not much simpler than that. Um, Lizzie joined County Council um, with the idea, and because we're the Highways Authority, it was the obvious thing that we took it forward. So we've been developing this from since about 2020 now. Um, this is sort of the one that's been designed specifically for the job. It meets all the highways regulations, a bit like what Mark was talking about. You can drive a HGV over this and it won't do anything. It's also now got a brush that helps both keep the cable in the gully and it also stops muck leaves getting in, which was one of the, one of the few complaints we had. We've installed 26 of these now in various trials. Um, the last trial we did, we installed them and we walked away. We, went, we didn't go near them for six months because we, we figured if we heard something, it wasn't working. We didn't hear anything for six months, went back to the customers and said, how do you like them? Overwhelmingly, people love them. So we are now moving towards rolling out up to 500 of these in a much more um, widespread trial, which we hope to start later this year. The, the aim being that we can turn that from being a trial into business as usual. There is one major blocker on them that I should highlight. And that is, whilst you have permitted development to install a home charger, if you have a driveway, you don't have permitted developments if you don't have your own driveway. It's written into the legislation. It was done for the right reasons in that they didn't want people installing charges and running cables across pavement with the trip hazard that that would cause. Um, they are looking, the, the government is looking at it and seeing what they can do, but just be aware. At the moment, that is probably the most significant issue we've got in, in, in smoothing the rollout of these types of uh, solutions. But as I say, OZEV are looking at it. We hope that's going to be resolved in the not too distant future. And that's a very good, very quick overview of Gullia. Take any questions. Paul, you are an absolute font of knowledge on that. Um, I do have one question, which is, of course, that then presumably does that gully belong to the the householder or to the council who pays for its installation and right. who pays the, for its we, we work we worked up two models um both ownership by the householder ownership by the council the simple version the simplest way of doing it is that the householder pays us to install it outside their house we then it simplifies the whole licensing thing uh, makes it much easier. We then take on the responsibility of keeping you know, up to uh, date in the uh, street. There is an ongoing charge for the licensing and, and that maintenance, but we uh, have calculated that you should get a payback when you compare domestic rates of electricity to um, uh, commercial rates in, you know, uh, commercial charge point operators of around about two and a half to three years. So it does pay itself back in a reasonable amount of time. Plus, as has already been mentioned, you get the, the, um, the convenience of having something on your doorstep, literally. Um, but yeah, that, that's the model that we're working to. And in a nutshell, uh, for other local authorities and for the Department for Infrastructure, is there anything as a local authority that you would say would, would possibly prevent you from installing or permitting the installation of gullies? I know obviously you said about the legislation um, about needing a, a driveway in order to install a charge point to get automatic planning permission, otherwise you need to get permission to do that. But provided that that permission has been granted, is there anything else that would be remotely seen as a burden given that you know the, it's the householder that's paying? There are some stuff. insurance things we're working through at the moment. But no, we, we're pretty confident that later this year we will be going with something that, you know, we'll be able to offer to the residents of Oxfordshire on an ongoing basis. And I hasten to add, and the point I wanted to make is we're also working with Trojan on their Aon. We've also worked with other people on other solutions because whilst we, we think the gully is a great solution, we also think the Trojan is a great solution. And the one thing in all of this space is one solution doesn't fit all. So we've got to have multiple solutions. Um, yeah. It's a lucky person that sat there in a house that doesn't have their own driveway that can actually 
access multiple solutions mm. that's just you know that they're, they're, they're in a very lucky space mm. there are people out there where one of these will work but not, not you know others won't I'll tell you what, multiple solutions is a darn sight better than no solutions, which is uh, certainly from what I've heard for on-street charging infrastructure in, in Northern Ireland has been a, a major bugbear at present. So I hope that those of you attending are paying attention. Um, but also, uh, Ben, uh, moving on to yourself, you have another solution that means that uh, there's, there's no touching of council or DFI property. Uh, so show us what you've come up with, Ben. Absolutely. So this this kind of stems back to 2016 when we wanted to buy a secondhand Nissan Leaf and, and we couldn't kind of make the uh, total cost of ownership work because we couldn't charge from home. So um, we well, I put together a thing that I'm going to call a contraption um, at that point. It was uh, essentially made out of a number of bits of old UPVC piping and and various little runners to, to try and deliver a cable and at which point it was just just for granny charging a cable over the footway so that we could essentially run an electric car without having to to worry about going to to charge at uh, some of the few charging sites with the supermarkets that that had charging availability so as part of this whole thing what we we have decided or what we worked out was that um if you can't go under it uh, you really need to go over it uh the the space above the footpath is is relatively uh, underutilized, one could argue, and this is a, a, an opportunity to do that. So when it's not in use, it does fold away in quite a neat, elegant movement. It's electromechanically deployable, so it's it's quite useful for people who have um, limited mobility. Essentially, the plug gets presented to to the car, um, and and being able to give agency to the homeowner is is critical. Now, obviously. The local authority will have an interest with regards to both planning and also the highways act um there's certainly ways around the highways act that we can we can explore um particularly when you think about utilizing some of the the current uh legislation that might refer to say the height of shop hoardings and so on so i've done a little bit of work with one local authority where we've taken some of the existing bylaws and we've thought about what we can adapt and adopt to to suit this and it we, that that was an interesting piece of work, but once again, it was perhaps a little bit early, early on, um, and that that particular local authority ended up having to slice uh, some of its um, its staff who were involved in this. So that that went on pause. I'm going to stop screen sharing for a little moment. Um, so when we we think about it, the the limitation of groundworks is is critical, um, just in terms of avoiding or reducing costs, uh, avoiding disruption, and also the space under under the footpath is is a very busy space, and you know I salute anybody who who works uh, in, in the pavement space because it is it is complicated, and and some of the work that some of these other providers are doing is is just extraordinary in terms of um, how they can map and locate where all of the different services are, be they water, uh, fiber, gas, electricity, and so on. So I know that's a a challenge, and and I love whenever I walk past a a place where they're digging it up it's always quite extraordinary to see see what goes on underground um as well as the kind of accessibility side of things i, I think having as many charge points as possible and, and as many options are, are, are critical because that's going to lead to a number of different sort of follow-on benefits the more charge points you have the smaller batteries that you can have the smaller um uh issues that you have with regards to to charging up your your fleet drive and so on so you know we we see this as a solution that homeowners and householders can deploy then they can share their their charge as much as possible but similar to to what joel t does with co-charger absolutely um but it's also about thinking of what's going on with our our, our footpaths the curbside is becoming an increasingly congested space and it's there's there was something done recently by by TRL, I think TRL, um, that we're looking at curbside management. Um, and essentially, when you think about what's going on with our curbsides, whether it be to do with charging, parking, micro mobility, shared mobility, uh, deliveries, they are incredibly busy spaces. And so we feel that our solution is something which, because it's, it's demountable, and I guess a similar way to Trojan Energies, it's, it's good for the current state of play with with our environments 
Thank you very much for that very uh, comprehensive summary. And it shows that, you know, there are solutions available even in the most kind of stubborn areas. And uh, there certainly seems to be interest from, from EV owners. Obviously, this is an additional piece of hardware cost on top of a home charge point in order to run the cable across the, the way. But if you're in central London, and you've got yourself a you know a nice shiny Porsche Taycan or something like that. You know there is a surprising amount of interest in this, um, but I mean hopefully hopefully we'll start to see more local authorities actually being as receptive as Oxfordshire County Council and as receptive as as East Lothian Council etc. Um, but nonetheless, uh, I love the ingenuity of, of ChargeBridge. The fact that um, you can basically go electric whether the the basically the, whoever's in charge of the pavement, whether they want that or not. Um, I'm aware we are seriously running behind time. Annoyingly, Anant's had to, to drop off, um, but I'll very quickly cover guided energy forums. So if you have a fleet of electric vehicles and you are um, struggling on, on site capacity to, to get enough charging infrastructure at your base, or if you don't have a depot and you're fully reliant on, on public charging infrastructure, so what guided energy does is they pair um, electric fleets who sign up to them with public charging infrastructure uh, at bookable off-peak times. Uh, so, you know, if you have a large charging hub, rapid charging hub, for example, that's uh, not got as much use overnight, um, then fleet traffic can be directed there. Uh, that's particularly going to be useful for, you know, large vans and potentially HGVs that would require uh, some sort of DC charger to give them a, a meaningful charge um, overnight. So, yeah, really clever uh, solution there. But if you get in touch uh, with Anant at anant at guided.energy, um, he'll be able to tell you uh, more if you are a fleet customer looking into this side of things too. But that brings us on to uh, to co-charger uh, who's doing something that has been doing something very similar at a domestic level for some time thank you joel for holding on i'm aware that we've been a bit behind schedule the two minute time limits on some of these slides have been yeah. um, have been extended to that but uh yeah as i say co-charger is, is is officially one of the uk's largest charging networks now i think so tell us more about how you've achieved that yeah i think it's been very frustrating because much to everybody's credit everybody's network's getting better we, we got to be the third biggest in about 18 months and i think we're still just third we're about to go to second but um i think the important thing is like everybody else has been saying co-charge is just one tool in the box it's just the free easy one that you do first. And then um, what I love about this panel is, as you've seen, the, there's a lot of really good solutions in here and, and it's all the patchwork and you need to use all of them. Um, and also combine them. You know, we're talking about the, the gullies and, the, and the, the arms going across the street, use those and then share them, but it's all about sharing. So it's pretty much just upping utilization of existing infrastructure we nobody actually knows i think we're probably north of half a million private charges now um most of them do nothing for all but about five or ten hours a week um all co-charger is uh community charging basically is our, our thing and it, all it does is it says you know what if you've got a home charge point sitting there doing nothing for most of the week or one in your small business car park it, it's just a platform that makes it easy for you to have an arrangement with someone who lives nearby who can't have a home charger or won't have a home charger um, uh, to use that charger as their home charger on a bookable basis. Um, and basically the whole point of it is, and this is, I would change the actual title to this session to not can you run an EV without a driveway, it should be will you? Um, because cans are relevant. We can all do it, but we're all early adopter types. Uh, Joe F. Public sitting down at Hub with his Facebook research, he's not doing it. So this is about changing that. And between us, I think the, the key point, I think as Paul said, it's about confidence. Giving the people in those, those dwellings that are unlikely to have home charge points, confidence to go, you know what, I'm gonna ditch the fossil fuel car. We need to stop thinking about EV drivers. They don't matter, we're not burning anything. We're not important anymore. Think about that guy down the pub with his trusty diesel. He's the one we need to stop burning stuff. So it's all about that. And it just does it by enabling an arrangement between the neighbors you get your host account, you get we call it a chargee account, horrible word, but it's what we ended up with. Um, and it just matches those two. So a chargee will register, usually just find one host nearby, link their account to that host, and then they can just book either in one go every week. You can book every Tuesday night for a year if you want. And the app does the reminders. So you know, oh, it's Tuesday night, I'm gonna go and plug in at Susan's house. You go plug in, start the session in your app, you go home to bed. You wake up in the morning, you go pick up your car, you drive to work or whatever it is you're doing. 
uh, and it gives you the closest thing to that home charging experience that you can get without having a home charger. Um, and it's basically about facilitating that arrangement. It came about because I had this arrangement because it was forced upon me when my charger didn't arrive. Doing it without an app is an absolute pain in the neck. I can warrant it is not something you want to do. So that's all it does. Um, I won't take me off so over time. So yeah, the, 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 the pricing is set by the host. There's a host calculator you use. It's working out about a third cheaper than public, although it's very difficult to compare like with like. You don't pay to park, that is vital. You only pay for the time the charge point is running. Um, we just take a 12% fee to run the scheme. Um, the numbers are all over the place because electricity prices are all over the place. Um, hosts can be, most of them are individuals with driveways. A lot of them are like that, that private dentist on the end terrace or whatever. They've got their car park and they put a couple of workplace charges in. Um, and this just lets them monetize those. So it's another really easy, quick way of utilizing what we've got. So your private motorist, you know, our aim is to get those people to stop ordering fossil fuel cars. And it does it by giving them all the things they need that convenient, dependable, affordable. Um, it's massive for fleet. We actually have a service where fleet operators just send us the postcodes of their drivers. And we say, well, these are the ones who are already near a co-charger host. And we even prime the host for them, set up the accounts and do all of that. It's, uh, we've got a thing um, just picking up with Uber where we're doing that. So we're hoping to hopefully reduce the number of Uber drivers having to sleep in their cars at night while they charge, which is awful. Um, but also, yeah, it's, it's just all about decarbonisation and focusing on the people that matter, who are the ones who are about to click on the purchase of a new fossil fuel car or a used fossil fuel car. Those are the people we need to think about and to get out of the mindset of EV drivers. We don't matter. We're EV drivers already. So that's what it's about. Um, I, I, yeah, there you go. So it's just a, an immediate way to make the problem smaller. So if you're a local authority, it's a, a lot of problem. If you're going to try and do the base charging option for these households, as well as all the destination charging, as well as all the route charging, this just makes that task smaller and means you can point your resources at the areas where this is no use to you. There are vast swathes of cities where this doesn't work. But what we do do is just reduce the size of the problem just for the sake of a communications campaign. It's just a matter of, you know, it, we did it in um, da, 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 Derbyshire at Belfer. Um, one person in their local team for decarbonisation in one morning walked around and got four co-charger hosts. Just by peering through hedgerows and going, oh, there's a charger, I'll knock on the door. It's that easy. And then you integrate this with all the other solutions we're seeing today, and that patch work works. And the overall thing, going all the way back to what I think someone mentioned earlier, is you then create confidence in your locality that it's okay to switch to an EV, that there are solutions out there. Because that's what it's about. It's not about tins and strings, it's about confidence. So that's what we do. We provide a really quick, easy boost to how to get that confidence out there. That's a point. And there's, there's arguably a greater deal of confidence with that bookable neighbor's charge point than uh, the kind of Russian roulette of is the solitary type two post uh, a couple yeah. of streets away going to be available that day? Um, I think so. And uh, I think it'll change. The data, but there's, yeah. there's two or three year uh, delay on data. I think what I like about the solutions here today, people are connected curbs on and charging. When those hit sufficient numbers and when the cars hit sufficient numbers, I think more people will get confidence because, you know what, I'll find one somewhere. At the moment, the mentality is I'm already change resistant. I'm not ordering that car because I know I read on Facebook that they explode or put puppies on spikes on Tuesdays or whatever they do. Um, and they think even if you've got lamppost charges down your street, the thought process is, oh, I'll find one once a week. No, it's not that. It's what if I need to drive urgently tomorrow and I can't find one the night before? That's why they're not buying. And it's all about getting inside the murky depths of the head of Joe F. Public at the moment. So between us, I think we can do that. Uh, Donald's got a very good question for you. Does the, um, I was going to say, does the FASTER project operate in the Republic of Ireland? Of course they do. Uh, does uh, does CoCharger operate in the Republic of Ireland? Not yet, but um, we are in discussion with Zevi. Um, that we are awaiting the paperwork. So quite excited about doing that. I think it's a pilot for later this year. Excellent. Uh, and Northern Ireland? Already there. 
Excellent, superb. There we go. So we're covering two thirds of the faster project regions and coming soon to uh, the Republic of Ireland. Um, so watch this space. It's good to see that expanding, um, particularly for, uh, as you say, um, areas that we're, we're public charging infrastructure at the moment is somewhat limited. Um, now, obviously, uh, you work on a, a bookable platform. Ryan, I think you'd alluded to uh, plans to trial a bookable system on your uh, public charging infrastructure in the near future. Is that correct? Yes, a, and a queuing system. At, Amazing. Um, one of our, uh, our Wallyford journey charging site. So I think that's another part of things. And people can see that, you know, there's, um, there's, a, there's petrol pumps for EVs and there's um, a, a way of managing friction because people will see on Facebook, you know, charger wars or some nonsense and they think, mm -hmm. I don't want any of that. If I can't charge at home, I'm not doing it. Um, the, you know, the law will change, the 2030 ban will change. It'll not affect me, I'll just not do it. Um, so we need to show people um, that you know these things are understood. We are moving towards um, you know scalable solutions. Superb. I'd be interested to find out more. I mean, we're, we're running out of time, but um, if people wanted to find out more about the systems that you're using to deploy a bookable um, system and a charging queue on your public charging infrastructure, where can they get that information? It's in my head. Oh, fair enough. <laughs> but um, but uh, definitely there are do commercial share solutions yeah, um, yeah. emerging. But you know, it's, it's you know, it's, it's the role of a local authority. I think one of one is to stimulate and support you know very early innovation of stuff, uh, identify yeah. a problem, and, and you're just like, yeah. And likewise, these. yeah. I mean, likewise, I can see CoCharger working with uh, with CP, well, sorry, with charge point operators and with local authorities to to develop a bookable system for their public charging infrastructure. So, obviously, Paul, you're you're saying, or Paul Gambrell, oh yeah, because we've only got the one Paul left on the call just now. Um, yeah, uh, you were saying about how you were starting to see um, a certain amount of increasing use overnight from from local residents as the confidence kind of grew that they'd be able to charge their car overnight. Um, and it's good that obviously Easy Charge is expanding the amount of charging infrastructure there, but it could well be that a chat with Alexa CoCharger could be beneficial for um, introducing a, a bookable system. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. I know that Easy Charge are actually working on a bookable system. Oh, there we go. Yeah, nice one. So, yeah, I didn't realise it was all coming out. It, it has actually proven to be more technically challenging than they first thought, because it's something that we, are, we plan to roll out early on, but it's taken time. Mm-hmm. Well, I, yes. I, I, how, how do you um, how do you inform other people? Make it clear that there's a, a booking. Um, what they should do if there is a booking. It's just yeah, it, it you know spins out of control sometimes. These things. True, but it's obviously uh, kind of early days with that, and uh, your trial, Ryan, will be particularly interesting to see. But certainly on the domestic side of things, CoCharger has got this uh, got this sewed up. It's looking really good from from what I've seen. We've uh, actually been signposting people to co-charger for since last year. We, we had a meeting with Joel and we thought it was such a simple, great idea that, um, you know, it, it, we actually have some details about co-charger on our website. And also when people come to us and say, um, I, I, I want to get an EV, but there isn't a charger in the area. We, we have a, number, a list of things that we suggest. And one of them is go look on the co-charger site, see if there's a a charger that somebody's sharing in your area. Makes sense. Right. And of course, it extends to the likes of the, the Nodem charge bridge from, from BEM, uh, being able to, to kind of book that out as well once you've got that installed on your house. Um, so yeah, the, there's not only been a plethora of, of um, solutions suggested, not just technical, but commercial legislative um, throughout today's webinar. But clearly, um, these are part of a, an ecosystem and you can join dots between them all to come up with something that's ideal for the location where you are. So I'm aware that there are some local authorities and Department for Infrastructure who've held on way past when this webinar was meant to finish, with apologies to Anant, as I mentioned before, and also to Kate and uh, Paul Wilkinson who've had to, to drop off. But um, I reckon this is the, the time to, to wrap up proceedings. It is, well, very quickly, I see that there is a hand up from an attendee. Um, Hang on, I'm trying to see which attendee it is, but if we can allow you to talk, we'll just bring you on very briefly for the Q&A. Uh, q and I see that um, all of your questions have been, been answered uh, by the, uh, the panellists who we have today. Shane, Mark, Joel, oh goodness me, you've all been at it. You've been absolute stars. So thank you so much for that, for answering all those queries. Uh, but yes, Paul, if you've got your mic on, we can take a quick question from you. 
there might be an accidental hand up. That's fine. Um, well, I do have one very quick question that was, was emailed into us. Um, so after listening to the, the last webinar, um, it made them wonder if uh, community energy is allowed to grow. Um, could vehicles with no off-street charging purchase cheaper energy and have it dispensed via a local authority supported AC charging network? That's an interesting one. So effectively sleeving electricity to um, you know, to an AC charge point for, for that specific person to use. Um, preferably 22 kilowatt load sharing, similar to, to what Mark was uh, describing with the dynamic load management on the, on the Trojan Energy Solution, others exist. Um, it could perhaps kick off with some car clubs, maybe with used EVs. I love all of these ideas. Uh, but yeah, in terms of sleeving um, community bought cheap renewable electricity to a public charge point, is that doable? Uh, who wants to come in on that one? Ryan, you you may have a view on this one. Yeah, I love stealing people's ideas. So like that Oxford Super Energy Hub thing. Um, uh, yeah, we uh, have looked at uh, uh, replicating that on our neighbourhood scale. Uh, we've got a 50 kilowatt solar array and a bunch of um, council um, flats and a, a, a public charger. I'm looking to put more charges. It's actually Electric State number. It's kind of the name. Um, but uh, yeah, that's exactly, you know, private wire, um, peer to peer via stuff. Um, and we'll continue to just try and secure funding for that. First attempt was unsuccessful, but, you know, we'll try again. Well, thank you very much for your input into that one. As I say, we will have to, to wrap it up here, but clearly there are loads of interesting ideas. There are loads of companies that can, can bring those ideas to reality. Um, again, thinking about the Agile Streets project and the fact that that obviously involved Octopus, Octopus Agile. Octopus is one of the um, uh, electricity companies you need to be with to get your dividends effectively from Ripple Energy if you co-own a bit of one of their wind farms. There's maybe some of the pieces of that jigsaw there to make that happen. It just takes a pioneering group of individuals, maybe an Innovate UK funded project, who knows, to, to, to prove that. So um, I can see Ryan frantically typing notes. He's, he's trying to keep his arm, his, elbow, his uh, shoulder still, but he's definitely typing notes there. Um, but yeah, thank you, everyone. You've been absolutely amazing. Uh, huge thanks again to Kate Terrell, Ryan Robertson, Paul Gambrell, Ben McDonald, uh, Mark Constable, Paul Wilkinson, Joel Teague, Anant Kapoor and Shane Rees. Uh, it's been an absolutely hectic panel session as I thought it would be as, as I'd um, dreaded it would be but honestly it looks as if uh, everyone's managed to gain a lot from that and I know that there have been uh, local authorities watching today who will have been frantically taking notes and as I said Brian Robertson and Paul Gamble um, seem to be open to uh, sharing their experiences directly and I'm sure uh, Shane, Mark and, and Paul Wilkinson would be very happy to talk to you about um, commercial models there too. Uh, and of course, uh, Joel at, at CoCharger, absolutely all local authorities should be signposting them. And Ben, I love your solution. Just go electric, whether anyone else wants you to or not. Um, so we will be back again on the 17th, oh, sorry, the 14th of June, it's the 17th today, 14th of June at 10 a.m. Um, to discuss profits or pitfalls. How easy is it to make money from hosting charge points on your land? So this is very much about how the uh, commercial charging networks we see today can provide charging infrastructure, whether you're a local authority or whether you're a private landlord. Um, is it worthwhile? Is it not? We will have some testimonials from actual site hosts for these charging networks as well as the charging networks themselves so hopefully lots of useful info for local authorities and private landlords once again thank you everyone for hanging on thank you for your time see you again next month <laughs>